Hi, thanks for uh, tuning back in and joining myself, Steve Hayes, and my colleague Michael Darby from Element. Today is an extension of the video that we did last time where we were talking about different regulatory requirements and really looking back on 2021 um, and I think really the purpose of today's video is to start looking forward in terms of what's coming up in 2022. So I guess uh, Michael, uh, some of the topics that we want to go through today. Um, I, I think we've got events coming up in the not too distant future. We've got the TCB Council for the US coming up. That's going to be, when's the, that, April time? The last week of April, that's correct. There's a basic training day on the Monday um, for anybody who's quite new to the industry who would hit the ground running with the TCB Council workshop, maybe confused by some of those topics. So we do a basic day or foundations day on the Monday. And then the bulk of the workshop will be Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And then I think, I mean, the normal format of those TCB Council days, as you say, there's the, the foundation day and then we go into like the FCC day um, and the FCC. What, what sort of things are the FCC going to be talking about this year? So actually we have the, the first day of the main workshop is kind of like international day, if you like. So there'll be a report from NIST um, on uh, MRAs and country agreements. There'll be reports from Industry Canada, or I said Canada, as they are now known. There'll be a report from everything going on in uh, the EU and the UK, and that will be from me. Um, and then the second day is the FCC day, so the Wednesday of the week. Mm. And so uh, hot topics, I think the FCC, they never tell us the agenda until right on the day, really. Um, but probably one of the most important things will be the changes to the RF exposure requirements. Mm. RF exposure has been a requirement for FCC certification for a very long time. Um, but it's, uh, within the rules, it's only ever applied to specific types of radio transmitter, so licensed devices and higher power unlicensed devices. There's been a statement that all transmitters should meet the RF exposure requirements for a while now, but um, the FCC have updated their rules and they've updated their guidance to make that really clear. And the, the sort of deadline for that coming in is expected to be the 31st of March uh, this year, 2022, uh, with a bit of a transition period of maybe three months. So we've been seeing drafts of the new requirements and we're expecting the FCC to go over that. Some of the things um, that I think will affect the industry, some of the more unusual licensed transmitters that have just never had to do this before, uh, they all now have this requirement. I think one of the things that industry will really struggle with is your basic low power unlicensed transmitters like RFID, um, near field communication, things like that, where the manufacturer will be expected to demonstrate that their output power is very low or they'll be required to do a SAR test or a, an RF exposure test. Uh, and that sounds pretty simple, but it's actually quite difficult to demonstrate that the output power of a low frequency transmitter is very low um, and uh, it's a long and complicated topic but uh, that will be quite tricky for some manufacturers mm. um, and um, here at Element we're trying to help manufacturers understand that. Great. Uh, yeah. Another big topic I guess they'll talk about is wireless power transfer which I'm sure you'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a while. Uh, and then the third day of the main workshop, so the fourth day of the whole event, is kind of an industry day. Um, and uh, so hot topics on Industry Day are Wi-Fi 6E, there'll be several presentations on that, uh, and cyber security, um, and then I'll be speaking about risk in compliance. And when I say risk, I mean the kind of risk assessment to the Radio Equipment Directive, risk of non-compliance, not to be confused with a, a sort of safety assessment, risk assessment. In fact, one mm. of our colleagues, Stephen Tate, he's recently put out a an article on safety risk assessments, yeah. whereas the uh, presentation at the TCB Council workshop will be more about kind of the, the risk with regard to getting a product to market, the R&D uh, sort of development to market stage and the life cycle of a product, that kind yeah. of thing. Great. And then, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned Wi-Fi, uh, wi Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E. These are terms that clearly everybody's heard of Wi-Fi, but not necessarily 6 and 6E. Um, and we've had Wi-Fi for years, so why, why really now is Wi-Fi 6 and 6E a, a, a hot topic? Okay, yeah, so it's a good question. So anytime there's a big change, so for example, 
we used to have 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, and then we introduced the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. So whole new frequency bands, <coughs> new different types of test, test equipment. Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E, this is a confusing thing. People tend to get the two confused or think that they're the same thing. Wi-Fi 6 is a protocol issue. It's like a bandwidth of the signal, modulation, things like that. You can have Wi-Fi 6 in the 5 gigahertz frequency bands. Wi-Fi 6E is an extended frequency range up to sort of 6 or 7 gigahertz. And so that's a, a, the new Wi-Fi 6 protocol at higher frequencies. Uh, so there are some new test types. Um, there are new frequency bands allocated. Uh, as you'd expect, um, the frequency bands for North America are different to the frequency bands for Europe. And in fact, the frequency bands for the EU are different to the frequency bands for Great Britain and the UK. Um, so there's the issue of which frequency bands can I work in. There's also the issue that all of these countries are doing a very kind of gentle, nervous rollout of the technology. So at first it's starting with low power, indoor only equipment uh, in a kind of, we'll put this out there, we'll see if there's any interference. If there isn't, maybe we'll start allowing higher, free, uh, higher power outdoor products in the future. Um, another big issue for uh, Wi-Fi 6E is the RF exposure thing. Now, we're working pretty closely with our RF exposure and SAR lab for portable equipment. This is equipment worn on the body. Now, traditionally, a SAR test is performed over um, a cube of body tissue. For example, a 1 gram or 10 gram cube of body tissue, where the RF energy would be absorbed by the body. But as you get into higher frequencies, the energy isn't absorbed into the body. It's much more of a surface level thing. Um, and so a SAR test wouldn't be appropriate. And you have this new type of test, absorbed power density, where it's looking at the, the power absorbed into a, a much shallower area of the skin, for example. Um, other topics on industry day, um, in addition to my risk uh, presentation and the Wi-Fi 6E presentations, there'll be lots of talk about cyber security. This is a, a, re a real hot topic at the moment. And Steve, I believe you're going to be talking about functional safety. So functional safety, um, it's a really interesting topic actually. And, and it, it's becoming much more prevalent in the world of electromagnetics. I think anybody that's been involved in safety related systems uh, has had exposure to functional safety for, for many years. Um, but as we become, as a society, more reliant on machines talking to other machines, the, the, the ultimate break at the moment is, if you're driving a car, as an example, your right leg. You put your foot on the brake, but if you're reliant on some electronic equipment putting the foot on the brake, you want to make sure it's going to work in all circumstances. And so functional safety in our world is making sure that things are going to work when they perform a safety critical function and not degraded because of things like electrical interference. So I'm going to touch on that TCB Council um, as, as one of the other presentations. I think there's a few other presentations from industry that will complete the day, um, but it should be a really good week. Um, starting, as you say, on the basics day, um, then obviously moving into things like the, the FCC. You, you mentioned that uh, we're not 100% sure on what the topics are there because it's a dynamic situation and then moving on to the industry day on on the Thursday. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so then beyond the TCB Council workshop, the next events we've got coming up are uh, the Red CA meetings. I believe you've been doing a lot of work to prepare one of the documents um, for that on uh, radio equipment into vehicles. Yeah. And oh gosh, this is uh, one of those topics that's been around a little while now already. Um, and yeah, it's a real challenge. This is more of a European thing, but it has a, a worldwide context to it. And making sure that manufacturers of radio equipment that get installed into vehicles, and when we say vehicles, we're not just talking about automotive type applications. Vehicles cover a whole range of different um, types, you know, trains, um, segways, um, what we call um, pedelecs, um, so, so you know the, these personal transportation devices, and, and really, it gets complex because um, 
Typically, the, the radio community based their test methods and standards on IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, derived standards. Um, and then from the automotive side, they typically base their uh, requirements on ISO standards. And so there's a fundamental difference in the way that you do testing different modulations, different frequency ranges, the way that you test the product, one's on a ground plane, the other one's in free space conditions. And so it becomes a, a really complex area uh, when you start integrating uh, the, these two different things together to form an overall piece of radio equipment. So the Red CA group that uh, you've just been talking about there, uh, we've actually spent a couple of days up in London um, uh, th this week talking about that uh, and, th and really the plan is to create a single document that provides guidance back out to the industry on, on exactly that. Very good, thank you. Um, another exciting event coming up in 2022, CISPA meetings in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, I think Element's playing a big part of that and uh, you're heavily involved, I believe. CISPA it itself is... Well, well, first of all, what is CISPRA? So, so CISPRA is the special committee within the IEC that deals with the protection of radio services. Um, there's a number of different CISPRA committees, and as you rightly say, the IEC general meeting this year is in San Francisco at the end of October, um, and uh, Element is sponsoring all of the CISPRA meetings uh, for San Francisco this year. So we're particularly interested um, and excited to, to be really involved in that. Um, and, and one of the areas for me that I focus on a lot is industrial, scientific and medical equipment. Um, and uh, wireless power transfer uh, or transmission being one of the key topics that we're talking about at the moment. Yeah. Very good. So any other hot topics that we've got going on at the moment you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I guess, I mean, there is one um, which is an impending deadline. So anybody that's listening and is a manufacturer of um, multimedia equipment, then the standard uh, EN55035, which is an immunity standard for multimedia equipment, there's an important date coming up, and, and that date is August this year. Um, and up to this point, uh, manufacturers have used a previous standard, 55024, which is for immunity of information technology equipment. 55035 was published and it effectively was an amalgamation of the IT standard, one for broadcast equipment and uh, one for professional video and audio equipment. Those three standards have combined into 55035 and there's some fundamental changes in terms of the philosophy, not of doing the testing, but how you monitor the performance of the product during testing. So it used to be that a manufacturer would say, do the testing, and you know, as long as there was an exchange of data or the document printed at the end or something like that, everything was okay. But in the legal framework that we now have in Europe, where we're trying to achieve legal certainty, it's much more specific in terms of what the performance actually needs to be. So for example, if you made an ethernet device, and you said it was marketed at uh, a, a, a one gigabit per second uh, ethernet, then during the immunity testing, you would need to make sure that that data rate was maintained throughout the testing itself. So, so there's some fundamental changes in the standard itself, but the critical thing is that there's been about a three year transitional period where manufacturers could have used the old standard or the new standard. August this year is the end of the deadline and all manufacturers will need to have updated all of their documentation, test reports, maybe done some additional testing in some cases to make sure that they comply with that new standard. So that's an important date coming up. I think we're putting out a little paper about that just to, to, to emphasize the point because it is a really uh, important uh, uh, aspect that manufacturers of those types of products need to be aware of. Mm, very good. Um, I've been spending a bit of time uh, on a couple of hot topics lately within Element. Uh, one of them is helping manufacturers with that kind of R&D to reality transition, this sort of risk-based, how do I plan for testing, how do I plan for certification, and how do I keep my product compliant through the sort of product life cycle. 
the old days of taking your product to a test lab and saying, I want to buy this test, and then coming away again, it, that, that's being really replaced with a much more holistic kind of, I want to get my product to market as quickly as possible. How can you help me do that? Because there's actually a lot to navigate. And as products become more complicated, manufacturers don't know every aspect of their product in the way that perhaps the regulations assume they do. And with that in mind, another topic that I'm often asked to uh, help manufacturers with is what do they do if they install a pre-approved radio module? In the USA and Canada and Japan, you might have certified radio modules. In the EU, there might be a module with a CE mark on it. So what do people do if they install those? So we're getting people asking you and I, Steve, to cover these types of topics in future chats. So uh, I look forward to covering those in future um, future chats with you now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's a great point because um, as we introduced in our previous uh, video, we, we said that this is just going to be an ongoing series of videos. So I guess for those that are watching, if there are topics that you'd like Michael and I to, to cover in, in future videos, um, then, then please feel free to get in contact with us and we'll make sure that we cover those. And they can be a wide variety of the things that we're pretty much experts in, you know, so, so it could be, you know, a, a sort of thought leaders in the field, as it were, you know, things like global market access, GMA, um, providing sort of advice and, and guidance at the front end if you don't quite know what to do in terms of what, what do I need to do to get into this market? How do I comply with this? What are the requirements for things like Wi-Fi, wireless power transfer? These are things that we're involved in all of the time and quite happy to talk through uh, in, in future videos uh, and, and chats. So, uh, yeah, look forward to speaking to you next time. Uh, but for now, thanks for listening and, uh, yeah, see you soon. Cheers.